fields to appreciate. We also have, this one is uh, native to the East African. We have Boran cattle, which is also originating from uh, Kenya and other East African uh, countries. We have East African goats also originating from East Africa. We also have the Gala goats, which is also originating from Kenya. And then we have the red Maasai sheep also originating from Kenya. Then we have black head Somali sheep also from Kenya. The camel, we have the one humped camel. And then we have several indigenous poultry. Then we also do a little bit of beekeeping, which is also considered as, as part of our livestock production. And then, as I said, uh, we have a large and diverse reservoir of animal genetic resources. Majority are indigenous and uh, are, they are classified as per the communities or reg the regions where they exist. Uh, maybe if you've read a little bit about Kenya, you know about the Maasai community, which is like our symbol. Then uh, if you look at these breeds, they are uh, locally adapted. And uh, this is just, a, sorry, an example. How do I remove this? Sorry, sorry to ask. The this pain here. Bayu, can you can you help? Yes. Um, uh, how to remove this pain because it's blocking some of my text. Oh. Uh, which uh, one? Please. Uh, Please. The, the upper one, the, the one for the zoom. It's not possible. Okay. Uh, you can drag by your uh, mouse maybe? Can you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's better. Maybe I put it down here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so uh, for the exotic dairy cattle, we have uh, Asha and Freshian. So the Asha is the red and white one. And then uh, Freshian is the black and white. These, as I said, are uh, imported breeds, but we use them a lot in the highlands. And um, they are the ones that are mainly used for milk production in Kenya. Then we also have uh, Gansi and Jassi. These ones are uh, also there, but they are not as common as the first two. Then um, for the beef or the dual purpose breeds, these ones, they used to be there, but as I said, nowadays, there are maybe one or two ranches, you can still find them keeping them because they used to be kept in the feedlots, but now the it became unsustainable. The climate was not so conducive. So we have a few farms that are still trying, but they are not there. So we had Hereford, Brangos, uh, Badin, Angus, and Charo Race, but they, they, all, they are no longer being taken uh, properly for beef production. Then we have the indigenous breeds that are, these are the ones that are mostly used for beef production. So we have the East African zebu. You can see they are diverse colors because they have not been uh, characterized, rather improved for any specific color. Then we have the Boran. This is a Boran bull. And then we have a Saiwal bull. Saiwal is also an indigenous breed that is kept in Kenya, but it was imported originally from Papua. Pakistan and India. So it is not native of uh, uh, the Kenyan breed. Then uh, we also have an Kole breed, which is a native of uh, Uganda and Rwanda, but also imported uh, to Kenya and is being used for beef production in some of the ranches. That is then, kept uh, in Kenya. Crossbreeding is also going on for the dairy cattle with the exotics and the indigenous. What actually we call, uh, or we used to call upgrading of the indigenous breeds to the exotic breeds. Then there's also a little bit of uh, exotic and uh, exotic, the different exotic breeds taking place, but this is not too common. 
then we have also crossbreeding of the beef breeds. Uh, we used to have cemental and uh, brown crossbreeds in along the coastal regions, but this is also not so much. Then we have uh, crossbreeding of indigenous versus indigenous breeds. So there's crossbreeding of Siwal and um, the East African breed. So during this crossbreeding, the idea was to improve the breeds, but then uh, because uh, and uh, especially when we are upgrading the local breeds. So in some regions in the highlands, it was not done properly. And uh, that one has contributed to loss of uh, some of the indigenous breeds in the highland areas. So it brought some questions of uh, sustainability of the breeding programs because uh, focus was not put to ensure that the the indigenous breeds were protected. Then uh, uh, about the goats, as I said, we had about 29 million heads, uh, mainly about five breeds for the, for the dairy goats. We also have uh, like cattle imported dairy goat breeds, particularly we have the Alpine, the German Alpine, Togenberg and Sarnen. I'll show you some pictures of the same. And then we have the indigenous breeds that I talked about. So the indigenous breeds, sorry, are mainly used by the, the nomadic communities. Those are the pastoralists and it is their sole source of livelihood for mutton, uh, or rather for chevron and uh, also for milk and for for leather well uh, so these are the examples of the dairy goats we have this is an an example of the token bags and these are the the alpine goats so the alpine goats the these two goats were also used for the upgrading the local goats then we have the Angora goat, which is uh, for mohair. And then we have the sun and goat, which is also for a dairy goat for milk. Then the indigenous goats, we have the Somali goats and then the Gala goat. These are the ones that are mostly kept, especially in the pastoral areas because they are natives of there and they are hardy. Then we also have the boa goat. So these are meat goats. And then the, this is the East African goat. Then uh, for the sheep, the indigenous sheep, we have a DOPA. DOPA is, was a crossbreed from South Africa. Then we have a black head, head Persian. And we also have a black head Somali. So they, they are not, if you look at them, you cannot because uh, the DOPA was uh, a cross of uh, the blackhead Persian, so you, they retain the blackhead. So it's really not very easy to distinguish them from the pictures. Then we have um, the red Maasai breed, I mean, the red Maasai sheep, and the East African fat tailed. So these are the red Maasai and these are the East African fat tailed sheep. Then uh, for wool, we have an exotic sheep, which is the mar merino sheep. This one was also brought in the 1900s, but we still have some farmers keeping them in the in the highlands, in the slightly colder areas. So they are kept for wool, but they also slaughter them for, for mutton. So that is uh, basically the first part of my presentation about the, the ruminant breeds. So now I'll upload the presentation for the other the other breeds
So I think it's this one, let me see. So then I'll look at poultry. So as I said, poultry, we have uh, several indigenous and it is the one that is kept by most of the farmers in the rural areas in the indigenous chicken and uh, chicken uh, is about 98% and we also have other types of poultry like the duck, cheese, quail, turkey and ostrich which only contribute less than 2%. So for the chicken, which is, as I said, is the main one, we also have commercial breeds. So we have broilers. So, and then we also have what we call improved Kienyeji chicken. So the Kienyeji is the indigenous one. Then we have layers. We have what we call Kenbro, uh, Sasso, and Kuroila. These are um, like improved, also improved indigenous chicken. So this is the photo of the, the three types, the sasso, the kuroila, and then the kalro. So as, as you can see, it is like uh, an improvement of the indigenous birds and the, the, the colors is still not, or the feather color is still not, uh, a uniform because it, it's still like an improvement, an ongoing improvement. So these ones are um, kept for eggs, but also for meat. So they are relatively maturing faster than the indigenous ones. Then uh, these are now what we call the, the true indigenous birds. So again, here we have several types. Sorry. And usually they are um, identified uh, using the, the unique features or their unique attributes. So like this one is the naked neck. You see that it doesn't have a feathers on the neck. Then we have the, this one is crested, uh, sorry. It's, it has a crested head. Then uh, we also have the frizzled feathers of the frizzled feathered uh, chicken. And then we have what we call the kuchi, which is a, a, like a game bird. And uh, uh, it, it is, has a long shank length. So with the indigenous chicken also, sometimes they are recognized by the regions where they come from, what we call an ecotype because uh, we do not have a proper breeding program. So they have not been able to be bred and uh, categorized as breeds. Then uh, for the broilers, mainly they are the exotic breeds, this ones, and uh, mostly they are raised by corporates and also by individuals. So we have large scale, farms that are raising them, but we also have a few small scale farmers that raise them. And the, again, also the layers, we the same, we have the large scale growers that are, are uh, also using the exotic breeds. Then we, I, I talked of the Kenbro, the improved uh, breed. So this is rare for, reared for both eggs and meat. So if uh, it is fed for six months, then they start laying. So the egg production is lower than for the layers. And if it is reared for meat, it takes longer than the broilers, but they're relatively hardy and they can be reared outside, not like in the intensive system of the broilers and the layers, the exotic ones. So that is about chicken. Then we also have some horses, the equines. These again are all um, uh, imported. So we have a few elite ranches. So 
which are, uh, I would say, remnants of colonial activities. And then uh, we also have uh, associations where they are keeping the, the horses. And uh, also we have stables and uh, also the horses that are used for riding competition. Then we have the donkeys. So the donkeys are mainly used for draft power, but a few people have also started exploring them for food, although it's still not very clear where we stand with the donkey, whether they are declared to be for food or, or they are still just beast of burden. Then uh, we also have rabbits. So the rabbits are uh, basically mostly imported. So we have the earlobes or the French lobe, New Zealand white, California white. We have the Dutch, the chinchilla and the Flemish giant. And then we also have the Angora rabbit for farm. So rabbit farming is upcoming, but it's not very strong in Kenya and uh, people have started embracing uh, rabbit meat, but its uh, production cannot be compared to others like pigs or even poultry. Then uh, we have pigs. So pigs are also exotic, but we also have some indigenous pigs but mainly the exotic ones are the ones that are explored. So we have the large white, this one, the Duroc, the land races, and then the Hampshire. So those are the four main uh, pigs that are reared in Kenya, but we have others. Then uh, we have camels. So I said it, we have the one humped camel, the dromedary, which is for meat and milk. And this is also very important for the livelihoods of the pastoral or the pastoralist in the arid and semi-arid part of Kenya. So because climates are also changing, so other parts that are getting drier are also exploring keeping of uh, Camels. So camels are again described according to the communities. So that is why we have the Rendile, Gabra, Turkana, and Somali, depending on the communities that are keeping them. So that is how they are differentiated. Then um, we have what we call the non conventional livestock. These are livestock that um, originally were not reared for either food or their aesthetic value. But now uh, farmers or people are uh, venturing into rearing them either for tourist attraction and also sometimes for like the crocodile for, for their meat. So we have a uh, chameleon farms, we have farmers rearing snakes, and then we also have the crocodile farm. These are very, very notorious with the tourists. Then um, we also have uh, other non-conventional livestock like the, the silkworm. So these are worms that are reared for their silk. Uh, then we have also butterfly production. Then we have others like uh, ostriches, quills, and guinea fowls. That those are uh, also like emerging uh, poultry, and uh, also some uh, llamas. So these these are the quills. So we have the indigenous indigenous ones, and then we have the I think the imported ones, like the Japanese coil. 
then these are uh, i mean these are the guinea fowls so these are uh, basically uh, found in the wild but people are capturing them and domesticating them and then of course we also have uh, ostrich farm and basically the ostrich farms are also for mainly for tourist attraction the small scale farmers are not having them then uh, we have the llamas this is uh, basically also being a uh, reared uh, by Egerton University where I went to school and also a few farmers also because it's also not native it's exotic but uh, for tourist attraction of course I already showed the silkworm and the butterflies then we also have a few farmers trying snail production for food. Okay, so that ends my second slide of uh, presentation. So basically those are um, some of the breeds uh, and livestock species what constitute what we call the animal genetic resources we have in Kenya. So I wanted or now to talk about, uh, uh, let me see, some of the efforts to manage this, sorry, to manage the, the product, as I said, uh, we want to look at um, their, um, their livelihood potential or how they contribute to the, the livelihood of uh, the Kenyan people. So let me see if I'm able to be the, directed to the FAO website. They have, uh, done uh, a summary of um, the contribution. I don't know if it is big enough, it, it, uh, you're able to see. I just want to... to uh, Dr. Salhi, sorry. Uh, we yes? still in your screen in uh, PowerPoint uh, screen, I think. Okay. So, so maybe you can stop your screen and then uh, share it again. To yeah, yeah, it's already see by us. Yes, so I just wanted to share the the report of FAO, uh, which shows the contribution of um, the livestock. So this is the weekly per capita consumption in percentage so as you uh, can see of course cereals and starches are, are or rather the crops are the main ones but you can see the contribution of dairy, dairy and eggs that's milk and eggs 14 percent and meat three percent and fish also three percent and then we have the others then um this was the, the bottom quartile and then the top quartile we have dairy and eggs being consumed uh, up to 20% and then the meat up to 60%. Then uh, when you look at the numbers of uh, households that are keeping livestock, so you can see that majority are in the rural areas, but we also have uh, it's saying the recording stopped by? Yeah, uh, I think it's no problem. Just go on. Okay, okay. So then um, the rural, uh, we also have um, uh, farm, uh, farmers in the, in the urban areas that are um, keeping livestock. This is, was the survey of 2015, but majority are, um, are in the rural areas. And as you can see, 
most of them belong to the poor and the, the middle the middle class so the the, the richer people are uh, the ones who are found uh, in the urban okay but as you can see majority of the population are uh, of the of the poor people then when we come to commodities <coughs> so these are uh, the projections and um, the demand and supply projections that was done by, in 2016. And uh, as you can see, it is ex the changes expected are from, um, from 170 to even uh, all the way, especially for eggs, all up to 500%. So that basically shows that there is potential to, because as the population is growing, we expect um, the people in the world to, to reach um, more than 9 billion by 2050. So then we expect that the demand for these livestock products is also going to increase. So already, at, projected about the, the populations, maybe slightly different from what I have because of the, the dates of the report. But the most important thing is that um, from um, the number of people, the number of livestock kept by households, as you can see, is that these are the number of the flocks or the the herds, and uh, you can see that um, majority are only keeping less than two cattle. And uh, for the chicken is where we have uh, the majority keeping between two and 15. So most of the farmers basically are small holders. So I think I wanted to use that to highlight and then um, this is just showing um, the population and um, the gdp from livestock so it's not much it's um, the agriculture is 26 and um, the livestock value is uh, was valued at two percent at this time okay then uh, these were the numbers by 209, but of course now we have a newer census was done and now we have a newer numbers. Then the households that are owning livestock, of course this, this is what they used to, to develop the, the figures that I projected up there. So I'll go back to, to my PowerPoint presentation, I hope. Okay, then, um, so I talk about how, how the management of the animal genetic resources are taking place. So if you look at the country, generally uh, there has been a minimal effort towards characterization, monitoring and developing an inventory of the animal genetic resources. And this has led to limited breed improvement, which has resulted to suboptimal performance of the animal genetic resources. So most of our indigenous breeds are either at risk of extinction or undergoing continuous genetic dilution despite their resilience. You remember I said because of the upgrading or the rampant crossbreeding without proper care, then some of the resilient indigenous breeds were wiped away and with the 
challenges of climate change, now we are looking for those hardy breeds and we may not be able to get some of the ones that had already been lost. So the sustainable development of our animal genetic resources is also constrained because we have a weak and uncoordinated policies and legal and institutional frameworks that can be used to, to guide these processes. So when it comes to management of these animal genetic resources, we find that the livestock keepers, that is the farmers or the pastoralists, and the communities, like I said, uh, the, you remember I said most of the animal, the breeds or the species are um, categorized according to the communities that are um, predominantly or have been uh, traditionally keeping them. Then we have producers and marketing associations. So we have producer association like we have breeders association that contribute to the management of these animal genetic resources. So there is traditional subsistence, majority of the pastoral communities traditionally relied on these livestock for subsistence. Then there is exchange and trade among individuals and communities who have used traditional breeding methods to propagate these genetic materials. Like if you're talking about the red Maasai, they have traditionally been reared by the Maasai. Then we have farmer associations. Like I've said, we have breed associations which are involved in development and conservation. So like for the Buran cattle, we have the brand breed societies. Then, of course, we also have breed associations for the exotic breeds, especially the dairy breeds that helps in uh, coming up with the breed characteristics or uh, the specific, uh, what do you call it, specific guidelines for uh, selection or approval of the the breeds when they are being developed or when they are being characterized. Then we have government institutions in collaboration with farmers or farmer-led associations like the breed societies who are involved in breed development, conservation, extension service, and also in regulation. So we have the ministry which is responsible for the livestock matters like the statistics and uh, extension and all other things that are, are related to livestock development. Then we have uh, the Kenya Stud Book and the Dairy Recording Services of Kenya. So these are the institutions that are involved in the breed uh, the stud book is the registration of the animals and then the recording services is for the recording of milk. So at least not really, we have a, what we call a, a system of registration and recording of milk for, uh, for genetic improvement. Then we have livestock recording center, which is part of the ministry and their work is to, to manage the databases, collect, collect the information, and uh, to do what we call genetic evaluation so that they come with the breeding values that are used to select the animals. Then we have the Kenya Agricultural, I mean, Kenya Animal Genetic Resource Center or CAGRIC. So this is the sole producer of uh, semen for artificial insemination. It's the only one uh, or the main one we have in Kenya for artificial insemination. And then of course we have the Livestock Breeders Associations that are uh, also part of the Kenya Start Book and the, the recording 
services. Okay, so that is there, but um, we have threats, some of the threats to animal genetic uh, resource management. One of them is non -adapt adoption of breeding plants and uh, unrestricted interbreeding among different breeds. Then uh, we have use of limited number of selected breeds and hybrids. This is, uh, I would say, it's not specific only to Kenya because um, if you look at the global trend, you see we in animal production, we are tending to be using only a few selected breeds and hybrids, the exotic breeds or the high yielding breeds. Then uh, degradation of the ecosystem. So here is uh, land degradation and here is some, some fires uh, because of drought. So those ones also, usually when they happen, we lose a lot of uh, animals, especially in the arid and semi-arid areas. And then of course we have diseases and natural disasters. So we usually have uh, diseases like uh, East Coast fever and uh, some other um, diseases that are endemic to the areas and uh, they contribute to the loss of uh, animal genetic resources. Then, uh, sorry, we have some conservation strategies or uh, uh, conservation um, ways we can use to conserve these animal genetic resources. Conservation is important because then we can uh, preserve these breeds so that they can be used by the future generations. So we have in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. So during these conservation strategies, the most important thing is to identify and list of all the animal genetic resources that are existing creation of a database of the indigenous breeds, particularly breed description and characterization, prioritizing the breeds for characterization and conservation based on their population structure, economic utility and genetic diversity. So when you want to know which breeds should you conserve or should you characterize first you look at uh, uh, how many are they is, are they in large number or are they are almost getting uh, extinct uh, uh, is the population able to to mate properly then uh, how is that breed being utilized does it have any economic value and then, of course, how is the genetic diversity within that breed? Then uh, we conserve the breeds in situ, that is where they are. And then we develop technologies for collecting and freezing the genetic materials. This is where now we come up with things like gene banks, or if it is uh, AI, if it is semen, we can have some frozen semen or cryopreservation for uh, use in the future generation. Then of course we have awareness creation so that people do not uh, over exploit or misuse or uh, people are aware that the, the breed, especially the indigenous breeds, they need to be conserved. So during characterization, what happens is that you look at the both phenotypic and genetic, where phenotypic, you look at the, the physical characteristics and then genetic is where you, you can use um, the genetic markers or you can, um, you can, uh, you use, you go to the library to, to genotype the breeds. Then, um, Different breeds, especially currently grouped as non-described. These ones, the ones that have not been described. 
Then we have specific adaptability and other characters that also need to be looked at when you are doing the characterization. So it is not just the, the phenotype, the physical characteristics and the genetic makeup of the animal. So constraints, general constraints to characterization and management of the animal genetic resources. One we have feed resource, which is um, scarce, uh, like in any, in most of the tropical regions, feed is a problem. And as I said, most of uh, our livestock production is done in the arid and semi-arid areas, which are 80%. So we are usually in threatened by lack of feed. Then we have inbreeding of the indigenous breeds within themselves. Remember, there is no control program for breeding. So in the pastoral communities, most of the breeding occurs half a sadly, and in the process we have um, inbreeding taking place. So again, we lack breeding programs for indigenous breeds. Then as I said, we have diseases like East Coast fever and foot and mouth uh, disease. So the disease is also limiting our ability to produce for the export market. And when the marketing is hampered with then even improvement of the breed becomes an issue. Sorry. Then, as I said, we have uh, institutional infrastructural challenges uh, where we don't have, uh, or if they are there, they are, they are weak or they have their own internal challenges in terms of human resource, in terms of uh, technical capacity or uh, even facilities. Like if we are talking about developing a gene bank, if you want to cryopreserve, we don't have those facilities. And this is related also to limited funding because other activities are prioritized. So some of the things that can be considered are animal reproduction and breeding. We can uh, look at molecular genetics, where, when we, where we can look at our molecular characterization, reproductive physiology. Here, basically, we'll be looking at uh, fertility issues. And then, of course, I've talked of um, cryopreservation of the semen. Artificial insemination technique. This is only developed for the dairy breeds. But for the other breeds or the other species, we are still not doing much of artificial insemination. And then, of course, we have a reproductive health control. We still have uh, situations where we have diseases like brucellosis, which are um, sexually transmitted. Okay, so the future. So we can have a dark future where we have extinction of native dairy breeds, meaning they are no longer there. They have all been uh, mismanaged and not conserved and they have all died. And uh, that means that we will not, the future generations will not be at an advantage. They will not be prepared so there is no sustainability. Then uh, we have a bright future. If we put some effort and uh, do some conservation, utilization and improvement of the native, especially the dairy breed, then uh, we can have a bright future where we can use these indigenous breeds for milk production and also for other products. Then priority is genetic improvement of animals. Then we also have improvement of feed resources. Remember, even if you have the good breeds and you do not have the feeds to give them, 
they are not going to perform. And then we, of course, we also, when you are looking at the feed resources, we also have to look at the feed technologies. So there is need to look at uh, innovations on how to improve access to feeds. And then we don't forget the epidemiology and disease management. So we look at ways of how we contain the endemic diseases. And uh, one of the things that uh, I know the government is doing is creating a disease-free zone because this is what is going to happen the export markets for livestock products. Okay. And that ends my presentation. So I'll get back to you. Bye. Okay. Thank yes. you very much, Dr. Migose. And now coming to our session for discussion. And we already have some question here in chatting room, uh, Dr. Yeah. Mikose. But uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you stop your share screen and then I will okay. share my screen? Okay. Is it oh, stop sharing? Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to share about the question from the audience yeah first question is from ina ahmad Bestari, uh, from indonesia yeah from ahmad Bestari. Uh, dr mikose you see in your screen yeah i hope can you see dr mikose sorry sorry i was talking to a muted mic oh, okay okay, okay. <laughs> no problem <laughs> yes so i can see the the question okay yes yeah. this is the question please yeah, what is the percentage ratio between the use of artificial insemination and natural mating of cattle farms in Kenya? Okay, thank you, Ina. So basically for the exotic breeds, the dairy cattle, that is where we have majority of the artificial insemination being used. But still also if, if you look at... Uh, the rural areas. I may not have the exact percentage. I think the last one I had uh, was 30% if you generalize mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the dairy farmers who are using uh, artificial insemination. And as I said, in most of the beef farms, it's still uh, natural. So, but again, uh, if you go to the rural areas, then um, because of issues of infrastructure and other challenges, we only have a few farmers using AI. Then uh, I hope that is sufficient. Okay, uh, Ahmad Bustari, do you have any comment? No, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then, thank uh, you. Yeah. The yes. second question for artificial semination is it used by local semen straw or imported from other countries? Thank you. So we have uh, both local, local in the sense that not for the indigenous breeds, but for the locally adapted dairy cattle. You remember I talked of uh, Kagrik of the or Kenya Animal Genetic Resource, and I said they're the sole producers of uh, semen. So we have, uh, through the breeding programs, we are able to produce uh, semen of locally adapted uh, dairy cattle breed. So that is what we call the local semen. And then we also import from other countries like the host and Frisian, and uh, also the Canadian Frisian, I think. And, um, I think also Asha, yes. Okay, so some of them are so imported, yeah? Yes, yeah, but majority is local. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because the local one is relatively cheaper compared to the imported ones. Okay, yes. and then the next question, let me share again the 
question from Reswati. Please, uh -huh. Dr. Mikwese. Okay, good afternoon, Miss Migose. I saw the buffalo race as non-conventional livestock in your country, whereas buffalo is one of the good meat producer livestock. What is the reason why didn't farmers like to raise buffalo? That is it due to the hot climate there? But I saw there are many dairy cattle that need the climate. So basically, I think I would say this is cultural. Most of the people are not, the buffalo that is here is wild. Mm -hmm. Actually, the one that they are calling uh, emerging water buffalo is more of a tourist mm -hmm. attraction, but not for milk like we find in, the, mm -hmm. in India or Indonesia. So mm -hmm. the wild ones are um, a bit, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they have not been tamed, <laughs> if I may say. Okay. Yes. So, so, yeah. Okay. yeah, they are not domesticated, so you cannot even go near them because they are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. So culturally, I think they, we did not evolve like that. Okay. So that is why it's not being reared mm -hmm. for milk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Reswati, do you have any question, any comment? Oh, it's enough to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Okay. Um, somebody wants to ask a question through the mic? Uh, do anyone to ask by microphone? I think uh, just uh, uh, about the feedback about the... the okay. Your, your okay. okay, okay, thank you. Okay, and then the next question, let me share again. Oh, yes. Yeah, from Jodi Aditya. Yeah, please, Dr. Migose. Good afternoon, Dr. Migose. Very interesting presentation based on data in your presentation. We looked that aquatic animals in Kenya are not, and not determined why is it happen it's because there are no aquatic animals or what i want to know about that and i want to know poultry population less than two percent in kenya why poultry population in kenya is less than ruminant population okay so i'll start with aquatic yep. so we have a uh, fish cultivation in ponds and uh, actually promoted by government programs because um, initially the fish, fish was just uh, harvested from the lakes and the Indian Ocean. So not uh, cultivated, but uh, the wild fish that is harvested. But then uh, the, the, the pond culture was introduced where well, now we, we construct ponds and then we cultivate fish, especially tilapia and um, catfish, that is clarias and trout. And uh, also in the coastal region, we have some shrimps and prawn being cultivated. But the reason why we say it is undetermined is because we do not have proper records to ascertain the number or the quantity that is being produced. So that is why you cannot say that uh, at the moment, like we are saying we have 38, uh, I mean, 28 million sheep, we cannot say that we have 28 million, uh, maybe tilapia. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, when it comes to the poultry, so, Poultry includes uh, chicken and other birds like the duck. So the, the chicken is a lot. So the chicken alone is 98% of the 45 million poultry that we have in Kenya. And it's only the duck and the other types, the duck, the geese, the ostrich, that are constituting the less than 2%. So it is not that we do not have poultry. Mm -hmm. So poultry is about 45 million, 98%, uh, that is chicken, and poultry together is 45 million. So we have a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yes. So yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, Jordi, do you have any feedback? Uh, thank you, Miss. I got it. I got it. I understand. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then, yeah, let me go to the next question. Oops, where is my screen? Yeah. Um. Yeah, the next question is come from yeah Rahma Aulia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, first I would like to thank you for the topic uh, you shared to us. I have a question in Kenya, what kind of cattle and the characteristic of meat that are liked by Kenyan? <laughs> 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 well, I don't know how to respond to this, but for me, for beef, we have uh, the mostly the indigenous animals, the, the boran and the saiwal and the East African zebu, not because they like the meat, I think, but because the climate favors these hardy indigenous animals compared to the exotic ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe they like the meat also, but I don't know, I'm not very sure about that. Okay. Yeah, but okay. the one that is most kept is the, the indigenous breeds. Mm -hmm. That is Boran. The Saiwal that I said is coming from India and Pakistan and um, well, originally imported from there. And then we have the local East African mm -hmm. Zebu, the small mm -hmm. one. Okay. Yes. And the name is do you, from the local one? Is there any specific name for the local? Boran. 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 Let me, maybe okay. I share a little bit. I okay. I, okay, please. If you stop sharing and yes. then I share, I think it's in this slide. Okay. Yeah, so the one that is having a black and brown, this is mm. the Boran bull. Mm. Boran. Mm. And then Sahiwal is from this one is the one imported from Pakistan and India. Mm -hmm. And then this, this, the one with many colors and also the white ones taking water here at the East African Zebu. So these three are the main ones. Okay. 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 Yes, I stop sharing. Yep. Uh, okay, and then we go to the next question. Mm -hmm. Let me share again. Ooh. Yeah, the question from Mohammed Murshid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. So nice presentation. Have you used male or female semen separately? in your country i don't get the question uh, uh, yeah me uh, i don't know if they can explain yeah or maybe Mur you understand better you interpret uh maybe we just ask Murshid. Murshid, do you there are you there yes okay please maybe you can explain more about uh, your question yeah yes thank you very much uh i i want to know uh, just uh, when we inseminate uh, everybody uh, want to give his uh, cup uh, female in the uh, context of uh, livestock population. Uh, I, I want to know the in your country, uh, when you inseminate straw, straw, cement straw, uh, yes. firstly, can, can you isolate X chromosome or XX for uh, uh -huh. female and or XY mm -hmm. for uh, male? Uh, okay. Just Sex. I want to know, uh, firstly, you can separate. The male, okay, sexing. The male has the sexing, yes. sexing, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank In you. No. Uh, In Bangladesh, uh, already, uh, already uh, we can try to introduce uh, such type of uh, technology, uh, AI okay. technology. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now it's clear. So the sexed semen uh, we use, especially for the female sexed semen yeah, to yeah. get... Uh, 
to get more hay fans, but the one we use, we import. So in our laboratory, we are still not able to do that. So for the local semen, it is not sexed. But for the, if you want sex semen, we import, mm -hmm. like from the Netherlands or from elsewhere. New Zealand, uh, yes. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, okay. I think thank it's clear, Murshid. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, thank you very much. And then we go to the next question. It's come from Moni Ruzaman. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, where is my slide? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, maybe like this. Can you see okay. my slide? Yes, yeah. yes, it's good. Yeah, please. So I want to know if there are any conservation strategy for local breeds like Indonesia. If not, is there any chance for sharing with Indonesia? Oh, so I think uh, I said that uh, we try we try to do what we call in situ conservation. Mm -hmm. That is uh, conserving the animals where they are. So when we improve the capacity of the, the custodians, those are the farmers or the pastoralists to continue using and uh, uh, utilizing the like the buran or the small East African zebu in the process, they conserve. That is in situ conservation, where mm -hmm. they are, where the animals are with the farmers in their local natural environment. So then the second one is ex situ conservation, where we have what we call the multi multiplication herds where we try, especially the government has what they are calling breeding stations for sheep and goat. So in those multiplication centers, then uh, they're able to, to maintain the sheep and the goat in those stations. Then we also have a, a research station, CALRO, called the Kenya Agricultural livestock research organization. So they have been keeping the side wall for um, almost, I think, from 1960s. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So like the, that is where the, the, the breed improvement was taking place. Because you remember I said side wall is imported from Pakistan. So when they imported the breeds, they maintained them at them. It used to be called National Animal Husbandry Research Center. Mm -hmm. So they, they've been keeping them there and taking records. That is where I did my MSc program with the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So then they maintain the breeds there and then uh, they sell the offsprings to the Maasai, the pastoralists. So it is like, uh, and uh, they are conserved within the station, but then they, they, they multiply them and then they sell the bulls to the Maasai to upgrade the indigenous ones. And also some, some people also keep them as purebreds. Okay. So that is there. And uh, when it comes to like conservation in terms of having a gene bank, We've not reached there. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there any chance for knowledge sharing with India? Of course, that one is possible. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And then can we speak? Mm -hmm. We yes. go to the next. Monibu Zaman, do you have any comment? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. It's clear, yeah? Okay, yeah. so go to the next question from Puspita from Indonesia. And let me share my screen again. Yeah. Uh, 
please, Dr. Mikusi. Okay. Nice. So I would ask, I would, uh, I would, I would I want to ask, would you explain more about the potential and constraints of camel farm in Kenya and what kind of camel that mostly exists? Okay, thank you. So camel has a potential because it's uh, able to survive in the arid and semi-arid areas. And uh, like we are also experiencing uh, issues of climate change where we are having more places getting drier mm -hmm. or getting less rainfall. So camel is one of the animals that can survive in those areas. So of course it has a, a potential. And um, as I said during my presentation, so most of the uh, communities that traditionally or areas where traditionally we did not have camels, now they have camels. Mm -hmm. So the main constraint to camel production, probably I would say, is uh, apart from uh, the general constraints, uh, is that uh, in many cases, the, the what do you call it? The, the marketing channel for the milk okay. because mm -hmm. the camel is, is mostly kept for the milk. Mm -hmm. So, and in the northeastern part, most of the uh, market is in the urban areas. So, getting the milk when it is still fresh from the production side to the market is, is still a big challenge because the infrastructure, the roads are not good, the electricity is basically not there in the northern part. So it becomes um, a big of a challenge. That is one, two, maybe you could say, uh, probably on management, uh, the, the knowledge and skills required for proper management because most of the people still just rely on the traditional methods. And sometimes like when the, it is too dry, then the camels are not milked. Mm. So they are only, the, 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 they are allowed to graze on the limited feed resources for survival. Okay, then what kind of camel? Uh, so I said it is the dromedary, the one humped camel, not the two humped. And then we have different types depending on the community. So we have the Turkana, Somali. These are the communities that are keeping these camels. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so they but use camel mostly for milk, yeah? Not for uh, beef, something like that. No, 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 mostly for milk. Because uh, it, you see, it's able to survive the drought. Mm -hmm. So when it is very dry, it is the only source of milk that or food that they rely on. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Pushpita, do you have any uh, response? Uh, no, sir. Thank you, uh, Miss, uh, for the answer. Okay, okay, thank you. And then we go, I think this is the last question from our colleague from Thailand. Okay. okay. Please. Okay, my name is Fan from IMB. I would like to ask you if there are any effect or problem about the inbreeding of cattle or beef in Kenya. Of course, the inbreeding is a problem because when uh, the animals are inbred, then we get to see the undesirable rebel traits. Like for example, if we you inbreed, the cattle, then you are likely to see the milk yield is going down or the fertility is compromised. So that is why we do not want inbreeding because it allows the undesirable characteristics to, to show. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Alice and Sarah, do you have any feedback? Uh, yes, I think 
Yeah, before we go to Bayu, I think yeah, we okay. still have a Bayu. Yeah, but we, before we go to Bayu, Arisara, do you have any comment? No, thank you. Okay. And then this is the last question, yeah. Uh from Bayu. Uh, yes. uh, just share my screen here. Yeah, from Bayu here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh the postgraduate program. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is a place in Indonesia. Okay. I, okay. I permit to ask my question. What is the temperature percentage for expand the dairy animal in Kenya for dairy cattle? I don't get, maybe you interpret for me this. Okay. The uh, temperature percentage for expand. I don't, I don't, maybe you can explain what he wants to yeah. uh, Bayu, do you have any, yeah, maybe yeah, for the okay, explanation? Thank you. Good morning for Kenya, ma'am. My name is Samad Bayu Aryawan from Animal Science Master Program in Halo Oleo Postgraduate Program, University in Kendari. So, uh, my question: What is the percentage? Maybe in uh, what's maybe in degree Celsius for expanded dairy animal in from uh, breeding until uh, until uh, post harvesting in Kenya in dairy animals. And for dairy cattle, is it use fan or air conditioner or natural environment? Maybe uh, okay. using uh, for uh, fan. Maybe uh, maybe it, it, it using uh, natural fan. Yeah. Okay. And if you see it, if you uses it, uh, what's the measurement to uh, grow? The dairy animals, maybe uh, for dairy cattle. Okay, let me try. Uh, you are asking, uh, like Thank you, uh, the, te the temperature range where we we keep the dairy cattle. I think that's what I have interpreted. So mostly the dairy cattle are kept in uh, highland areas, where the temperature ranges. An average of 19, but ranges between, say, 20, or maybe because of the night, 19 to 25, mm -hmm. mostly in the, in the highlands where it is the temperature is cool. Then um, in a situation, in many of the cases, if they do not, if they are kept in a zero grazing unit or like a barn, and... Uh, because the temperature there is not too high, then the many farmers, especially the smallholder farmers, they do not use anything to cool the animal. They don't use any fan. In uh, some large scale farms, the way the barn is constructed, they have vents at the roof. So yeah. it is the vents that are, uh, and then the roof is raised. So that sort of provides some cooling. So that is in the large scale farms where they are more modernized. Mm -hmm. But many of the, the smallholder farmers, the barns are built in such a way that one side is open. Yes, yeah. one side is open so that there is air flow. And mm -hmm. because the, the temperatures are not so high, so then the animals, are able to survive, so they are not provided with artificial farming. Okay, yeah? I think it's clear, yeah, by you, yeah. Okay. By you, yeah. So, so mm -hmm. maybe yeah. dairy animal uh, can be adapted, can be adapted to natural in natural environment because yes. Kenya uh, has. Has a uh, has a uh, hot weather, maybe uh, so, hot weather. So we don't keep them where the weather is hot. We only mm -hmm. keep them yeah. where the weather is cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then, yeah, I think it's end of our session for today. And Dr. Miko say thank you very much for your nice presentation, nice sharing knowledge. 
specifically for your from your country and uh, before we uh, close this session let me share my screen again and i invite dr tuti suryati uh, head of our department in ibb university please dr tuti uh, uh, do you have any speech for dr mikose please okay thank you pak bai uh, uh, dr mikose uh, on behalf of department uh, of animal production and technology i would like to give you a certificate uh, of appreciation uh, thank you very much uh, for joining and supporting this program and also thank you for uh, your nice lecture and uh, interesting information uh, you have shared to us. Please uh, take this uh, certificate as uh, representative, uh, as our representative, uh, gratitude for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so very much. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I was also very thrilled to do this. And I would uh, also want to thank uh, Windy, yeah, Al Zaha for uh, reaching out to me and giving me the courage to do this. So thank you so much. I don't know if she's there. She want to say something or? <laughs> Windy, are you there, Windy? <laughs> no, but I think we have edit. Do you remember edit Aditya? Yeah? So, yes. Hello, Sally. Hello, Doctor Sally. <laughs> yes. Can you show your face? <laughs> I did show your face, please. Yes, of course. I will edit it on my video. Hello. <laughs> hello. 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 <laughs> hello. 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 Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, this is so nice. Uh, of uh, course. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for your yes. presentation. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's like yeah. Iranian, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Small world. <laughs> okay, thank you again, yeah, Dr. Mikose. Yes. I hope yes. yeah, in the future we can still contact and then maybe in the next summer courses we also will invite you as a lecturer oh, yes. again. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you very much again and yeah, Okay, before we close, maybe please we want to take a picture. This is, uh, yeah, please, uh, anybody for participant, you can uh, switch on your camera and then the committee, uh, Pa Arifin or Pa Cimas, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you, uh, Pak Arifin. And yeah, uh, Dr. Mikuse again. Thank you very much for joining with us. And yeah, feel free if you want to leave this meeting because maybe after this, there are some uh, announcements specifically for uh, uh, participants. Okay, again, okay. thank you. And goodbye. Yeah, thank See you, you so next much. Time, goodbye. Yeah. Keep safe, healthy. Yes, bye. Bye, bye. Okay, and then, yeah, uh, uh, this is that's all yeah, for our class for today for lecture nine and lecture 10. And then we will see you again for tomorrow. And before we close, uh, maybe there are any announcement from Pak Asep or other committee, please. Pak Asep, do you have any comment or announcement, Pak Asep? Yeah. Yeah.